when we employ quantitative research methodology the tools for data collection also need to be quantitative we have already listed several quantitative data collection tools such as interview schedule questionnaire rating scale checklist inventories test and many other we shall discuss today about most of the time which is used tool is questionnaire we'll see what is a questionnaire what are different types of questionnaire when to use questionnaire how to construct a questionnaire and how to analyze the data which you receive through questionnaire as i said questionnaire is the most popular tool of data collection for research what is a questionnaire it's a tool which solicits information from the respondents what kind of information it gets you can get any type of information any kind of information about knowledge about their attitudes about their way of life about their thought process you can get this information from the respondents but most of the time it is in the written form so it's a format which we send to the respondent and we get that information from them this tool is called questionnaire the title of this tool is questionnaire so there are questions only most the this tool consists of several types of questions yes different types of questions and it's a pool of questions very uh, nicely systematically logically arranged so that there is a flow in answering that so it's a device which consists of variety of questions generally the questionnaire is sent to the respondent so you have to select a sample and send this questionnaire to different respondents you can send it by email you can send it by post you can send it by hand but it has to be in written form and you give it to the respondent to fill it up now the respondent is expected to fill that at his or her level and send it back to you again they can send it by hand or they can send it by post or they can send it by email but questionnaire need not necessarily be only sent it is also possible that you call all the respondents to your institution or you go there and in a classroom say for example you are you are selecting a sample of 60 you ask them all to come and sit in a class this sample is selected randomly or whatever way you want to select them purposive sample quota sample or a cohort you have selected that sample now you want to administer a questionnaire there is no need for sending it up you just call them here and give those questionnaire to them it can be administered in face to face mode you are there and the students or the sample respondents they read the questionnaire answer it and give it back to you this is another way of collecting information getting data collection through questionnaire this is face to face mode of administering questionnaire now as a researcher you have many tools available to you when do you select questionnaire that is a question you have to use certain criteria now when your resources are limited both resources money and time you can select questionnaire because for administering it doesn't take much time it doesn't take much money also because you just make copies of it and give it to them if you send it by email thousands of people can be contacted in a shortest possible time and then you get it from them the data the questionnaire filled in the questionnaire you will get it from them so when you are stuck with time and money questionnaire is the right instrument for data collection the second criteria when you want to use questionnaire is to maintain confidentiality if you are using observation schedule or an interview schedule you know the person who is responding to you whereas in questionnaire when you give the questionnaires and anonymity can be maintained you ask them not to write their name on it so when you collect questionnaires when you get questionnaires back they are fully anonymous and then the confidentiality is fully maintained so when you want to use the confidentiality as a major criterion for your research collection data collection that time this instrument questionnaire is the most appropriate tool
and because anonymity is maintained, it is also possible the percentage or the possibility increases that your respondents give you more honest answers because they know fully well that their name is not there. The third criterion for using questionnaire as a tool is when you want to corroborate the findings from other tools. The test is given, inventory is given, now you really want to know whatever is said about this particular respondent is true or not. I mean it is, you want to corroborate that with other findings. At that particular time if you use the questionnaire again to the selected sample, the data which you get and the data which you already have can be juxtaposed and that would give you a complete profile picture of the respondents. Now that you have decided to use questionnaire as a tool for data collection. So let us know more about this questionnaire. Now that you have decided to use questionnaire as an instrument for data collection, we have to know more about it in order to use it further profitably and effectively. We must know variety of questionnaires which are available to us. Mainly they are classified into two, one is closed form and other is open form. Let us see what is closed form. Closed means answers are already given and it is kind of a select answer. You have given alternatives and the respondent is supposed to select the most appropriate answer or alternative to him or her. So the, you ask them to say yes or no, you ask them to put a tick mark out of four which is the correct one, which is more appropriate for you or you may ask them to rank the given statements or you may ask them to encircle the choice or you may ask them to underline the choice. These are the different ways but what it boils down to you have given them alternatives and they have to select from that alternative. There can be only one alternative or there can be multiple alternatives. For example, if you ask them what is your age group and if you give three age groups there can be only one answer. But there could be other things, which of these newspapers do you need? There can be multiple answers, not necessarily only one answer is appropriate for them. So you, you have to keep in mind, though you are providing them with alternatives, sometimes there can be only one alternative or there can be more than one alternative. Let us see one example. This is an example of closed form. How do you collect your solid waste at home? There are five alternatives given in one open basket, in one closed basket, in separately for wet and dry waste, do not collect at home but throw it in a dustbin nearby to house and this is a very important aspect as any other because you have thought about four alternatives but there can be fifth alternative also. So we are providing for that any other please specify. The moment you do this, this closed form has changed to open because then you have to code because there can be many answers. But generally these type of questions would not have so many alternatives. Here the respondent is supposed to tick one. Let us see another example. How often do you use following mass media for getting news? If you see that on this first column, Four alternatives are given, newspaper, radio, TV and news magazines. And on vertical side, daily, twice a week, thrice a week and weekly. Here the respondent is expected to put a tick mark for whatever mass media he or she selects and the frequency also whatever is appropriate. If they are not using any mass media, there won't be any answer. They may be using more than one mass media. But there cannot be more than one column where they are putting the tick because if you are reading a newspaper, there would be only one tick mark in four columns, daily, twice a week, thrice a week and weekly. These criteria are mutually exclusive. So there would be only one tick mark. So we are forcing the choice. So this is closed form is also called forced choice. We are forcing a choice on the respondent. Let us see what are the advantages of closed form. As you can see that it is not time consuming, so it is one of the best advantages, it is very good on time and money. It saves your time and it also saves your money. But how does it save your time? You have administered that, 
Now, whatever time is taken by respondent is different. Your time is saved on analyzing or tabulating or coding the data because you already have the alternatives ready and they are already coded. So, what we have to do only that number, that number, that code has to be entered. So, time is saved on coding and tabulating and analyzing the data if you are using questionnaire. So, again other analysis of percentage, standard deviation, mean, all these things can be quickly done because you have the score in your hand. Similarly, if because it is objective type, you are asking them to only select. Today we have the scanners which scans the questionnaire and picks up which is correct and which is not correct. It can, there is nothing like correct and incorrect, but the coding can be done by the software itself. And within no time, all your respondents' question is, if they are of this type, they can be coded. So, it saves lot of time. This closed form of questionnaire is very restrictive and the alternatives for each questions are given. And hence, it can be used to track the opinion of the whole cohort, the sample over a period of time by using the same questionnaire. Because every question has a set answers or alternatives. It also helps because if, you, if your questionnaire is open ended, then there can be extreme answers. In this case, because the answers are all given, stated and uh, the respondent has to select one, these extreme cases are already taken out, weeded out. That is an advantage of this closed form. But you must also understand that not every question has a set answer. Whatever we think as a researcher is right, that does not really work. So, many a times it is advisable that we give that openness, that freedom of expression, whatever they want to say to the respondents. And that is why there is another type of questionnaire which is called open form questionnaire. And in this open form, the questions are not restricted, they are not closed, they are open. So, they will they will be asked, what is your opinion about? So, the, the respondent is expected to write his or her response, opinion, thought, ideas in that format. And that is why there can be many. Every individual can have different type of answers for that. That is why it is called open form. Now, if you take the same example before we have seen, what is the frequency of using the mass media? But if we ask them which mass media generally you use for collecting, getting the news, you are not giving them, you are expecting them to write their own answers. So, variety of answers will come because they do not know how to group them. Now, it is your headache to sit and code them or group them in whatever categories you would like to have. In open form, the respondent is expected to give their reasoning. What is their reason and why they are thinking so? So, both these things are given by the respondent, not by the researcher. So, as you can see that it will take more time on the part of the respondent because they have to sit and think and write. This takes more time on their part. They may think of not answering this or they may not like to answer in full. They do not like to write a big essay. So, they might cut it short. So, all these things happen while responding to open ended questions. Now, if you have more questions like this and you send this questionnaire, the return rate of this questionnaire is much less as compared to the structured one because that is easier for them to answer. Here, they have to sit and write in their own words and every time you would be asking them, why do you think so? So, they have to also give the reasoning. Generally, respondents do not like to write big answers. So, what they do? They keep the questionnaire as it is and then getting back the percentage is very less. Similarly, there is a danger that if whatever words you have used, they are not interpreted in a right spirit because you are not there, you have sent it to other people at their place. So, if the interpretation is not done properly, the answers also may not be correct. For example, let us take the same example, you are asking them which mass media do you generally use for getting news. Now, if the respondent does not know what mass media means because it is a jargon, 
if they do not know what mass media is, they may not give you answer or they may give wrong answer. So the data you have collected through this question is maybe not so much useful to you. So it is better that either you describe what mass media is or you give in a closed form. But people use this open form. So what, is, what are the advantages? There must be some advantages. You can see that when people are asked to write in their own words, the answers, the reasoning, the data is very valuable because there is no restriction. Because what happens when the researcher thinks he or she may be thinking based only on the research studies done before or his or her own experience. Whereas the experiences of the respondents may be different and when they come out with their answers, this data becomes very valuable. It is very rich. You get wide range of responses when you are not tightly defining that this, this should be your answers. So variety of answers you get through the open form of questionnaire. Sometimes it also happens that you are not expecting some answer and these kind of responses, unexpected answers, but they are very insightful answers. We have not thought about them. Even when you do the pre-testing, you have not thought about, you didn't get those responses. So such unexpected responses you can get if your questionnaire is open-ended. Even if you have a closed or very structured questionnaire, it always happens that we, the concluding question is open. We ask them, ask the respondent, do you have anything to say, any things to add to this? We have asked 20 questions. Now do you want to add something to it? What are your views about it? These, these are open-ended questions and this question is inevitably, invariably asked at the end of close of questionnaire. So it's not that even if your questionnaire is structured or closed form, there's going to be one question which is open-ended. What are the disadvantages of open form of questionnaire? Let us see that so that you will have some idea what kind of combination to be used. The very nature of open form requires them to study it individually because it is open. We are asking about their own views. So you cannot ask to the whole group. It has to be answered individually. It has to be asked individually. And that is why it takes more time. It is time consuming and both at both level, yours as well as at the respondent level. Because it is open form, you are not expecting a particular answer. There can be 10 answers, there can be 20, there can be 100 answers. Now you cannot automatically tabulate them because you do not know which answers will come. You have no way to code them beforehand. When the answers come, when you receive those open-ended questionnaires, then you have to sit and find out question number three. What are the answers? So all those answers must be written one after the other. So if five people are answering the same thing, it, it is possible. Then the frequency is five. But it's not always so. Many people, if you ask them to opine, then they will come out with different opinions. And coding that takes your time. Then tabulating that takes your time. Then analyzing it, again it will take your time. Because unless you group them, unless you classify them, you have to give some kind of a treatment before you start analyzing. You have to give them some scoring. So how would we give that? Then you have to sit and study all these responses and then code and score and then tabulate. So it is time consuming. If you have low budget and even your budget of time is also low, then you should not go for open-ended questionnaire. That will take more time. So you have to see a combination of both closed and open. Now let us see how to construct a good questionnaire. It has certain steps. As any instrument, if you want to prepare, there are steps you have to follow. Now step one, is that you must be clear about what is the purpose of questionnaire. And this purpose you get from your objectives of your research. And if you have hypothesis, then the hypothesis also helps you in identifying the purpose of questionnaire. Unless your purpose is clear, you won't be able to include the questions in the questionnaire tool. Once you have identified the purpose, then the next step is to identify the content. 
identify the information which you require from the respondent and that information is also arranged sequentially. There is a relationship between if you are having the whole content that can be categorized, classified and the sections can be formed and we also should show the relationship between section 1 to section 2, section 2 to section 3, how the information will flow. It has to be arranged logically and sometimes it also has to be arranged psychologically so that the respondent does not feel that he or she is answering the questions arbitrarily. So, the arrangement of content is very essential. Once you arrange that, then the questions can be formed. But before that, there is one more step that you, ha you have to identify your sample, your respondents. Who are these people who will be answering your questions? That is a very crucial point. If it is students, if it is managers, the women principals, whatever and who are the group members, who are the respondents, accordingly you will use the language. So, when you go for framing questions, you have to keep before you the sample, the, the respondents who will be answering the questions. So, first identify that sample. You may not go and identify the sample, but the characteristics of the sample have to be stated. This would help you to frame questions, the difficulty level, the use of language, the arrangement, everything depends on who is going to answer. Once you define the target group and also define the or identify the expertise which you expect from the respondent, then you start framing the questions. The questions are framed on the basis of the content, the sequence which you have already prepared in step 2. If you are thinking of using closed form, then the question and the probable answers, alternatives also have to be thought of and those have to be written there. Now, this some research is already been done, how many alternatives can we give, 3, 4, 5, 10, how many? So, but there is no consensus on how many alternatives we should give. But if it is related to opinion or it is related to strategies, then it is good that we take care of involving, including as many alternatives as possible so that it becomes a closed form. Otherwise, you have a choice of using open form, then directly ask a question, what do you think about? When you start framing questions, you also have to think about alternatives and give those alternatives along with the questions. Now, your framing of questions are ready, you have arranged them sequentially logically or psychologically, whatever way you want to do. You have also thought that it is open-ended or closed-ended. Now, your whole structure of questionnaire is ready. Now, two more things are to be done. What happens with questionnaire, it is one-time instrument because if you are using it for a purpose, then this questionnaire is not used for any other purpose. So, what happens? People think that why to do the standardization? We are not saying that you do standardization, but reliability and validity need to be established so that you are sure that your instrument is reliable and it is also valid. We will see in detail how to establish reliability and validity a little later, but this is a very important step when you prepare the questionnaire, its structure. The next step would be once this is reliability and validity is established, then you have to try it out on the real sample. Of course, this sample will not be included in your sample of data collection, but who are the people in your population? These people should be selected, small number and this questionnaire need to be administered to them. We will also see, this is also called pre-testing or pilot testing. How it is done, we will see in a short while. But these are the main steps of constructing a good questionnaire. What is most important in questionnaire is its language. When you send this instrument to your respondents, you are not there to explain the meaning of every word. If it is misinterpreted, if it is not understood, it is wrongly understood, the researcher is not there. So, it is very important that language which you use should be carefully used. Let us see what are the aspects of language, how this language really works in a questionnaire. First of all, define and qualify the terms that could easily be misinterpreted. We have taken the example of mass media. Now, some people may think that newspaper is not a mass media. So, it is misinterpreted. What is the definition of mass media? 
is your mobile mass media. So there is a room for misinterpretation. You identify all those terms so that they will be properly taken care of. Be careful in using descriptive adjectives and adverbs that have no agreed upon meaning. You think occasionally means three times a week. But somebody might say occasionally means two times a week or hardly any time. These are the terms which can be interpreted differently by different respondents and on the basis of that they will be answering. So the data which you are collecting may be erroneous. So you have to take care while using these words. Sometimes it happens that in a statement we use double negatives. Double negative means positive but people don't understand that and if they don't understand the statement itself they may give wrong response. We have to avoid double negatives. The sentences, the language should be so simple, the sentences can be very simple sense statements, not compound or complex with so many clauses in it because to comprehend that becomes challenging and difficult for many people. Sometimes we alternatives which we give, they are not appropriate, they are also not adequate. So if you give that these kind of alternatives, so people think that this is only half the statement. I want to add something to it, but there is no possibility of adding because you have given alternatives. In this case, the respondent becomes a little agitated. He or she thinks that I want to answer and you are not giving me this opportunity to answer. And there is no alternative of saying if any other an answer you give that. If that is also not there, then it becomes really challenging for the respondent. So please avoid, you have to be very careful about inadequate alternatives given for close type of questions. Sometimes we tend to prepare a double barrel question. In a statement there are two questions, an answer to one may be yes and answer to another question may be no. So now you are asking for two questions, it is not the same answer. Do you think that newspaper are most effective? This is one question. So there is an answer whether yes or no. But if you add certain things to that and then answer to that is no and first answer is yes then the respondent is in a fix. What should I answer? These kind of questions should be avoided. Sometimes if you wish to give emphasis to one or two terms, then you underline them or make it bold so that attention of the respondent is brought to that emphasis. When you ask them to rate or compare, is this better? Then you have to say better than what? Because there is a comparison and if there is no reference point, with which they should compare or rate, then they would find it is very difficult to answer this question and they may keep that question unanswered. So whenever you want the, the respondent to rate or compare with something, that reference point is very essential. We also have to avoid unwarranted assumptions. There are assumptions which you think are correct but these are the assumptions which are not acceptable by the respondent because you have say 50 respondents in your sample. Now not everyone is with you on these assumptions. So because what happens we have certain assumptions and on the basis of that assumption we also judge others. So these unwarranted assumptions which are not necessary for preparing questions should be totally avoided. When now you know the sample, you know their expertise, keeping that in mind you should frame questions which would be understood by all. So what we generally do minimum denominator we select. So this is what everyone will understand. If that is done then there is a possibility that you get correct answers, responses from your respondent. You also have to construct questions which would elicit whole response. Have that in mind, what response we expect? And for that you construct a question. It should not be done half hazardly so that what happens half answer comes. We don't want that because then you will find it very difficult while analyzing. Then you will you will find out that oh this answer is not there, this response is not there. Why did it not come? Because the question itself was not properly phrased. We have seen that in the beginning before starting framing the questions we have to structure it, we have to find, prepare sections and also show the relationship among the sections. 
if we do that then when you are classifying the answers responses in particular section particular subsection that becomes easier because that is a variable which is um, around which you are framing various questions so one variable and there can be 10 questions which are related to that variable so all these answers can be classified for that variable this becomes easier if we keep that in mind while framing questions it also happens that you have collected questions questionnaires from respondents now they are with you lot of open ended questions are there and now lot of information is collected now if you think somebody else should sit and classify that then they may classify using their own framework here what has happened you are a researcher you have prepared a theoretical framework on the basis of that you have objectives on the basis of that you have stated hypothesis now you are very clear about it so if you start analyzing you start classifying that that becomes very good very systematic for your research and there won't be any omissions unnecessary omissions while you classify them this was all about the language this was all about how to frame questions because questions are the most important part of any questionnaire second important part is arrangement of the questions logically or psychologically so that from easy to complex we can go ahead and as it gets complex the people are the respondents get mentally ready to answer these difficult questions challenging questions complex questions and they are ready for it you can't start asking complex questions first and easier questions later they have to be logically arranged in the questionnaire now your questionnaire is ready you have taken utmost care about the language also what is what remains are two things one is to establish its reliability and its validity what is more important is validity validity is of two types one is internal validity and other is external validity internal validity refers to the measure what the researcher wants to measure so we have to ask a question is this tool measuring what i want to measure if your answer is yes it is valid internally valid now that means the content which you have selected this content reflects your objectives and hypothesis if you have other type of validity is external validity now you know that external validity refers to the generalizability of your data you are collecting a data all the researchers think that though i am collecting it from a sample this should be applicable to the population from which the sample is drawn now this is called generalizability of that data if you want to enhance that generalizability that means you are talking about external validity of your tool and in this case the tool is questionnaire we have seen that the validity is very important and there are threads to validity we have also seen that questionnaire because it is sent to respondent and it depends on the respondent to give it back to you the percentage of receiving the questionnaire is very low as compared to interview or observation schedule because there the researcher or the interviewer goes directly and meets the respondents here it is not so so the low rate is a challenge to the validity how to improve that further that we must see why there is a low rate of return there are many reasons maybe people have not understood what you have you are asking so they may return it but it it is half done you have 40 questions and they have answered only 20 questions so this is incomplete questionnaire is of no use to you because variables all variables cannot be tested using this half complete test so even if you have received it it is considered as not received so this is known as low rate of return so again language is very important if your language is good understandable comprehensible then people would like to answer again we said that if it is close type chances of respondents answering your questionnaire is more in terms of close form if you compare it with open form improving the content validity or establishing content validity can be done by sending it to experts in the field first of all generally we ask our own friends and ask them to read because if the third person reads it then they find some lacuna they find some questions 
very lucidly written, some questions very complex language is used. So a third person can tell you, your own friends can tell you. But this is only the first level. If you select experts in the field who know your subject very well, in which you are doing research and also know about research methodology, the tools. If you select such people, at least five people, these are the experts in the field and give it to them. But not only your questionnaire, but along with that you must give them your objectives and also your hypothesis and request them to check whether these are the objectives, do these objectives get reflected in the tool and getting their feedback. If you get that feedback that this is not correct, this language is not correct, this word is misinterpreted, this is not comprehensible, you have to change that based on the feedback which you get from the expert so that your content validity is further enhanced. Once this content validity is established, what remains is to establish the reliability. The reliability means your instrument is reliable. Reliable means what? If you give this instrument today and if you give the same instrument after 15 days, we expect that the similar answer should come. If now today one person is getting score as 80 and after 15 days the score is say 60 or 120, that means there is something wrong. We find out the correlation coefficient to show that there is a relationship, high positive relationship in test and retest scores. This kind of reliability testing is called test retest reliability. So what we do when we select a sample, this is not a sample for your actual data collection, this is a sample drawn from the same population to test. So you give it to them and you give it to them after 15 days or after 10 days, whatever time you think appropriate and then find out that whether they are getting similar scores. They will not get 100% similar because it depends on the frame of mind, your, the way of, way you answer, your, where you are sitting, your mood, okay. So there are many aspects where you will not get 100% similarity, but the coefficient of correlation must be quite high, more than 0.8. So that if you establish that, then your instrument is reliable. There is another way of establishing reliability which is called alternate form reliability. What we do? We prepare two parallel forms of questionnaire. One form has 30 questions, other form also has 30 questions, similar sections, they are parallel forms and they are given to two groups. So you are not wasting time after 15 days. The same day you give it to two people and then find out the coefficient of correlation to not two people, two groups of sample and then find out the coefficient of correlation between these scores of both and then see if that relationship is high enough then your tool is reliable, it is giving same results. So generally for a PhD level research because this is not a standardization of tool, you are only using a tool for collecting data. So people may think why do I need to have a rigorous reliability and validity. But if not rigorous, at least test retest reliability should be found out and content validity need to be established. If we do these two things, then you are confident that the tool which you have created, constructed is really valid and reliable. This tool is now valid and reliable, you are sure. But now you have to pretest that or this is also called pilot testing. The pilot testing means you are taking the same population from which you are going to draw your sample. Say you are talking about mathematics teachers. So mathematics teachers in municipal schools. So that becomes your population. You may be selecting another 100 people from there, but now you select 10 out of this population so that you get some idea because this is also a representative sample. You select this and try this tool on these people. So when you get responses, lot of data is collected about the tool itself. So pilot testing is very important. What questions do we ask? What are the aspects do we test while doing this pilot testing? First of all, we want to test how much time does it take to complete? Is it taking 10 minutes? I thought it will take 10 minutes, but in practical they took 25 minutes. That means I was wrong in saying that people would answer it very quickly. It is taking time to think and write. 
So now you know that average time is about 25 minutes. Some people took 20 minutes, some people took 40 minutes, average time is 25. So you have an idea of the time it takes. You also can check with them if there are any words which are ambiguous, which are not understood by them, which are vague. This feedback from them would help you to go back to your desk and modify those words. Now you have already given it to experts. Huh? So experts have not thought that this is ambiguous. But now you are trying it out on real people, sample. So if they find it difficult, they find it ambiguous, they find it vague, you must respect that. Even if you are experts, those who establish the content validity have not said there is any ambiguity. It is the real sample which is giving you feedback, you must go with that. So those words, those terms should be changed, modified appropriately. You should also ask them whether the instructions given on top of each question were very clear. Did they understand those or how did they find those instructions? Unnecessary instructions can also go. So we have to remove those. Anything which is unnecessary should be removed. Why should we tax our respondents by for reading something which is not necessary? So even the instructions which are not necessary can be taken out. So we want to have perfect understandable instructions so that their time is not wasted in finding out, in understanding what exactly the researcher wants. This pilot testing would also allow you to take out the questions which are not that good, which are not necessary. As I said, instructions can be taken out, even the questions can be taken out. There can be a duplication of questions. People would tell you, question number 3 and question number 8 have nearly the same thing. Why did you ask that? they would tell you because their job is to tell you that they are, they are your evaluators in a way. So if there is unnecessary duplication that also can be removed. Even if there is no duplication but you think this question is not necessary, it has no meaning, it has no value but you had included it somehow, at this stage you can remove that. You see there are various stages at which you can improve the quality of your instrument. You should not say I have prepared the question and now I will directly go and use it on my sample. There are ample opportunities where the tool can be sophisticated, standardized, made better and better at various levels. Now your instrument is ready, questionnaire is ready with in all aspects. You have prepared the structure, you have prepared questions, you have arranged them, established reliability, validity, pilot testing is also done. Now you want to start data collection. You have already identified who will be the people in the sample. So now you identify them, select the sample. Suppose your sample is that of teachers in municipal schools. So they are teachers and they are working. So if you want them to respond, you have to take permissions. So for administering any questionnaire, there is certain, there are certain steps which we must follow. One of the step is that we have to take permissions from the authorities or even from the respondents to send the questionnaire to them. Other is that there should be a letter which is covering letter which explains the matter, the, your research, your objectives and then seeking their cooperation and collaboration. And the third thing is doing follow up. Let us see one by one, getting permission is of two types. One is of that person himself or herself, the respondent. You have to ask them, would you like to help me in getting this data collected? Or you can also ask him that I value your opinions to a great extent and your answers, your responses are greatly going to help me in understanding A, B, C variables in much better manner. So, Talking to them in this manner and getting their permission, can I send you this questionnaire, it will take 20 minutes, something like that. So once you get that permission, this is individual permission. Sometimes it happens that cohort, suppose you want to work with students of STEM standard. These are the students that are studying in particular school. So you have to write to principal and get permission that can I come and administer this questionnaire to them. Can I give this questionnaire to them to do it at home and then bring it back to school? I will come and collect. So permissions are of different types. In what happens in municipal school, there is education officer. So who is the granting authority? So you may have to go to education officer. So it depends what kind of 
uh, respondents you have in mind and to whom are they reporting, who is taking care of them. Sometimes it happens that principal may say yes, but parents may say we do not want to trouble our students, do not give questionnaire to my child. This also happens. So, you have to take permission from parents, convince them that answering this questionnaire is not going to affect your child in any manner. In many countries and even in India, there is always ethical committee. This ethical committee gives you different formats for writing to people when you take permission. Suppose you want to administer a, a questionnaire to your own students. Does that mean that they have to answer? You have to write to them saying that I am requesting you to collaborate with me on this project. But if you do not, if you choose not to answer, this is not going to affect any of your internal marks or external marks. Because there is a fear that if I do not work with the teacher, naturally my other achievements may get hampered. So, you have to really assure them that these things are different, research is different and your achievements on assignments are totally different. Then there is ethical question also, is the questionnaire which you are going to send to them going to provoke them, going to evoke certain feelings which may be detrimental, you have this ethical committee will ask you those questions and then your answer is no, then only they will allow you to send the questionnaire. If there are questions which may agitate the respondent, you have to say it clearly, two questions here may have this kind of implications. Can they avoid those questions? If they cannot avoid, then you have to take their permission for answering those questions also. So, it is not as simple that you prepare a question and just send it by post. There is a step in between that you have to take permissions from them make them aware what you want to ask, make them aware what is their responsibility in answering that. In the covering letter, you also have to write that you will take utmost care in keeping their confidentiality at the highest level. You will not disclose their names. Even if you ask to write their names, you should not disclose those names if they are not willing to do that. So, these kind of assurances are very much required in your covering letter and then you have to follow those. This honesty in giving you responses will come only when this kind of assurances are given. So, administering questionnaire is not only sending it by post. All these things are very crucial for getting the desired data information from the respondents. Now, you have sent the questionnaire by email or by post or by hand. You have also given the time limit. You have said that I would expect to get it back within 15 days. So, kindly make it convenient to respond. Now, they do not respond after 15 days, 30 days. So, after 15 days, if you do not respond, you have to do the follow up. So, follow up is a great thing when you are using questionnaire because people do not give you the data when you want it because they have other priorities. So, again you have to write to them, request them, the 15 days are over, how much time would you take, ask them and then give them time. You can also say, can I send someone to collect it because people are, no, I would not say lethargic, but they do not have time to go to post and post it. So, if you can ask them, can I send someone to collect it on so and so date or what day can I send someone. So, if you as for, I mean if you request them for giving support, you are giving them the support in sending it back to you. So, the chances of getting the questionnaire back are increased. So, continuous follow up on phone by writing to them or by sending emails, by SMSs. Now, all communication channels should be used so that you get the questionnaire back, but you should not irritate the respondent. If you do that, then they will say, I do not want to answer. So, then you are not getting your questionnaire back anyway. You have to have a balance while, while doing the follow up, you have to do it in a good words, modestly, respectfully, so that the filled in questionnaire comes back. You also have to assure that all the questions are answered, because if some questions are answered and some are not, then it is incomplete 
questionnaire and it will not be useful for you to use that questionnaire. We have to discard that questionnaire because incomplete data on some of the aspects which may skew your data analysis. What happens here in questionnaire, you have given it to say 100 people and 40 people have responded. 60 people have not responded. Who are these people? It also may have it like this. Those who are interested in your topic, those who are positive are sending you the question as field. So, all the data which you have got is all positive. So, you are interpreting, you are analyzing and interpreting data which is already skewed. This is a danger in getting 30 percent, 40 percent questionnaires back. If you can get 100 percent questionnaire back, then it is not possible 100 percent unless you go to them, have a cohort, administer it there and then and get it back. I did that for my PhD studies. I went to many schools in many districts of Maharashtra, but I went there personally. Before going there, I had taken permission. And all those 50 students, 40 students, they were sitting there. I gave them the question is not one, there were 16 tools, but students did that. 16 variables, not tools, 16, but 16 variables were tested. But I got 100 percent questionnaire back because I went there personally. It took a lot of time and it also took a lot of money. But my satisfaction was that whatever sample I had selected, they all gave me their questionnaires back. If you do not do that, if you send it by email or by post or by hand, then follow up is very essential. Otherwise, getting only 40 percent or 45 percent, 30 percent questionnaires back will definitely give you a skewed result. Questionnaire is a very important tool and it is widely used because it is easy to construct and it is easy to administer. It is not time consuming and for cost wise also it is much cheaper than other tools and hence researchers tend to use questionnaire more. And if you are using questionnaire then you must know what are the challenges in preparing a questionnaire. We have discussed that how to construct a questionnaire, how to administer a questionnaire and how to analyze the responses of the questionnaire. When you analyze you will require different statistical tools, statistical techniques. In some other session, we will see what are the statistical techniques available to a researcher when you score your data which you have received through the questionnaire. Thank you.